putting Smurfs, putting Smurfs, ducks, lemurs, and party terms to the service of African languages. I really have no idea what, that's, what that means. Um, hopefully at the end of the presentation we do know. Um, so Martin Benjamin is presenting. He is the founder and director of Kamuzi, uh, which is an NGO dedicated to gathering linguistic data and setting the data to work within language technologies, with a major goal to include languages that are otherwise neglected in research and trade. He began Kamuzi in 1994 as a sideline to his PhD in anthropology um, at Yale, um, where he focused on a, a Swahili dictionary. Uh, that was a very early online experiment in what would later be termed a crowdsourcing. In response to demands from other African languages, he, he developed a model for a multilingual lexicography uh, through which languages uh, interlink at a fine grained semantic level. These knowledge based relations uh, undergird, under, uh, uh, underfunded translation technologies he's currently building for all um, 7,111 ISO coded languages. Uh, among his writings, um, he is the author of Teach You Backwards, an in-depth study of Google Translate for 108 languages, an empirical investigation of Google's results in the context of larger questions pertaining to the enterprise of machine translation. His lab is now seated at the Swiss uh, EdTech Collider at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, a really nice place. Um, okay, I'll shut up now and I'll let uh, Martin Benjamin do all the talking because I'm really curious what this what this title means. Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I um, will share my screen now and do what I call some pre-meterations. Pre so the, the little setup stuff that we all have to deal with to uh, get these meetings happening. Uh, so bear with me while I find my th things to share. Okay, uh, and I discovered not too long ago, hold on, sorry, you don't necessarily see that there's a bar now over, there we go, uh, that you can actually, once you start a slideshow, you can go to pointer options, turn on laser pointer, and then you get this nice red pointer. Do you have, do you see my pointer scrolling around on the screen? Yeah, I can definitely see that. Okay, good. So, um, and then I need to somehow close out all of these people, all these pictures that are over at the top. Okay. And are we good? Does everybody have my screen now? Good. Um, I should also say that this, I, I would be quite happy to take questions in the middle if, if there are things that are not clear, because I'll be introducing a fair number of terms, um, concepts that are kind of outside of things that you might have experienced before. So if at some point I'm either talking too fast or uh, seem to be talking in code, please, I don't think I get to see your hands go up, but somebody might be able to shout in and say, please ask a question, you know, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to be back in POTS. I was there um, in person three and a half years ago and enjoyed the, enjoyed the visit. So somewhat disappointing to not be able to actually get on a plane and see you all. But on the other hand, this does make it easy to, uh, to, to have this sort of a, uh, a meeting again. So let me hopefully, okay. Uh, I'll tell you, start by talking a little bit about Kamusi. Um, Kamusi is the Swahili word for dictionary. Actually, before I start, I should explain that I did recently have eye surgery. So if you're seeing a very dark, bloody red eye, I apologies, but that's uh, better than, uh, th than before. So um, I, I, I hope it doesn't look, look too bad for uh, everybody to see. But okay, so Kamusi is the Swahili word for, for dictionary. Um, and as Menno said, and this started out as a project for Swahili. Um, and the goal, which is more than we can ever actually achieve, is a complete matrix of human expression across time and space. So what I mean by this is that we want to get, use develop this as a knowledge resource 
for people to learn languages and learn about languages as a data resource for computers to be able to do things with that with, with the linguistic data and more specifically as a basis for any to any translation is one of the any any so within any language that we can get into the system to go from that language to another language um, As Mano said, we started at Yale in 1994 and spun off in about 2009. And we're now registered as a nonprofit in both Switzerland and in the United States. The academic home has been at EPFL since uh, 2013, uh, now at the uh, Swiss EdTech Collider, previously at this, uh, the Distributed Systems Information Lab in uh, directly, at, directly at EPFL. We're also working closely with Akalan, the African Academy of Languages, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, but that's the uh, 55 member states, the, the intergovernmental language organ for the 55 member states of the African Union. Before I start, I will introduce some of the terms that uh, will be coming up. So one is this idea of a lemur. So those of you who are familiar with uh, dictionaries or lexicography will know that this you will know about the lemmatic form or the, the, the lemma. Um, so this is the form that you look up a, a word in the dictionary. So if you have in English, if you have a, a, something like C, you know, there will be a lot of different forms, C, C, saw, seeing, seen. Um, you don't go separately to seen to find out the same thing that you would for, uh, for for C, so lemur, the 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 lemmatic form is um, is C, and I call it a lemur because it's cute and makes for good visuals, and therefore it's easier for people who are not lexicographers to remember what this is all about. Uh, there's also uh, language people often talk about multi-word expressions or MWEs. Um, I think this is a fairly hostile term for people to try to understand what's going on, so I call them party terms because these are words that um, play together, take on certain meanings when they, when they play together. Um, so if you have something like kick the bucket, uh, there's nothing about kicking and there's nothing about bucket in the idea of somebody died, but so, so but when the words play together, they take on that particular meaning. Another one might be on the up and up which uh, you, know, you could not possibly figure out just uh, without, without knowing more about the language, you couldn't figure out that this, that meant that somebody was being honest with you. Um, there's nothing about up or and. So um, of course, we're all also talking about Smurfs in the title. So a Smurf is this thing, a spelling meaning unit reference. And I will get more into detail on what that is, but this is uh, what the, the acronym stands for. Um, so this is the intersection of a specific spelling form of a word, uh, you know, the, of, of the, the, the lemmatic form of a word with a specific meaning. So you'll see that C, something like C had many different meanings. You know, I saw a movie is different from I uh, saw a doctor. Um, but so each of those meanings of C, it gets, uh, is 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 split off into this thing we call a smurf and the the reference is you know it gets a number so that we can use that as data for other processes later on um, and yes that's architected so that it's cute because then we can again remember what we're what we're talking about um, rather than some more uh, esoteric technical sounding jargon uh, that we that you would then have to go back and try to remember what what, what is that and then again, similarly with ducks, ducks are what I uh, stands for data unified concept knowledge set. And these are basically things that mean the same, more or less the same thing across languages. So uh, within and across languages. So the word, so car and auto and automobile are all part of the same duck as would be voiture and coche in Spanish and other things that all have the same meaning of a four-wheeled motor vehicle, they would all be part of the same dock. We'll come back to all of those. And then later on, I will introduce this idea of costumes and wardrobes, but I will uh, come to that later. Okay, so here's the roadmap. We'll talk, first we'll talk about the problem that we're trying to address with linguistic data in Kamosi. 
And then we'll talk about CAM 4D, which is basically the solution for, for these problems. And then I will talk about other projects or a variety of projects that we have going on in Kamusi Labs or available in Kamusi Labs if there are students who are interested in working on some of these things um, as a semester project or even a master's project, or even some of them are uh, appropriate for PhD projects. Um, but I'll start with the problem with linguistic data. What, what is it that we're trying to address here? So first I should specify what I'm talking about when I talk about data. So I'm talking here about words that have been digitized in a way that can be used within computer processes. Um, that, uh, that means if, if somebody has a word file with a whole list of words in it, you know, if, um, or an Excel spreadsheet or something, that's not really data yet. That's a bunch of information, but it's in its own little silo and it can't be used outside of that particular uh, framework. So um, there might be many different African languages, for example, where some where where there where a dictionary exists or a word list exists. But until that has been coordinated in some way, it's not interoperable data. So what we're trying, what we're aiming for is being able to take that knowledge and put it, at, put it to service, um, manipulate it and uh, use it for, for, for additional applications. So let, let me start with why, with the, uh, the kind of the traditional approach towards words and dictionaries. So here, here we've got something which is a word, something like light. L-I-G-H-T, that, that means something in English, right? Um, hello? Okay. Um, but really that's just the lemur, right? The, the, the lemmatic form, where you go in the dictionary, you go to, and you look up L-I-G-H-T. But there are a lot of different things actually that are L-I-G-H-T. There is um, this idea of, uh, something that's not dark. There's something, the idea of something that's not funny. Uh, I mean, that, that's not serious. There's the idea of something that's not fattening. There's the idea of something that's not heavy. All of those are L-I-G-H-T. They just don't really have anything to do with each other other than that particular confluence of spelling. Um, so if we were to try to go and put those, come up with a term for those in another language, we actually have to find ourselves usually with, often with things that are different terms in that other language that don't, that, that all would be L-I-G-H-T if you were putting them to English, but act independently in their own language. And when we come to party terms, that L-I-G-H-T even loses those meanings. So we've got something like um, give it the green light. What is it to green light something? Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with lighting, with, with light in any way. It means to approve of something. Um, to light up the town, again, doesn't have anything to do with uh, with with L I G H T the way in in any of those other dis definitions with the red light district triple light fantastic so these are all party terms that additionally complicate things uh, we'll come back to the party terms much later in about twenty minutes um, so you can see if we try to add in other languages here we've got the French term we have a Swahili term we have this Finnish term we have the Thai term. These are all L-I-G-H-T and you know, they all map in the dictionaries to the same lemur in English. We somehow want to actually make them into little, these little clusters that map to each other, but not get confused in L-I-G-H-T, but because of that, coincidence of spelling, they, any of these could end up in a computer being confused with any of the others. Um, and this is where if we're all in, per in person together, you would all laugh because this is what I call linguistic linguini. But we'll go with the silence right now because that's how Zoom works. Um, 
So what is the CAM4D solution to this tangle? Actually, before we do that, let's talk about a few more problems with linguistic data that are specific to Africa. Um, there are roughly 2,000 languages spoken in Africa, depending on how, how you slice and dice it. Um, very few of them have any digital resources, and I'm talking about even a word file or a word list or you know some some sort of uh, rudimentary set of what is this going on with this language with this language. Um, but then those what has been digitized, you know, put into a word file, put into an Excel spreadsheet, has not been harmonized, so you can't use it together as interoperable data. Um, Potentially, this all could be put together, and you could be able to go between languages, between African languages, from uh, you know from Zulu to Wolof, or from you know beyond what we think of and often think of as everything should go from from Zulu to English, or Wolof to English, or Wolof to French. You know, um, but these things can't operate together because they're all, as I said, in their own silos. Um, so this is a big challenge that we've got uh, because as long as each of these languages is outside of the digital sphere, um, that the people who speak those languages are also uh, excluded from the benefits of language technology that, that especially English speakers have come to appreciate. So what is the CAM4D solution? Uh, let me say, yeah, I'll, I'll explain the 4D in a bit. Um, okay, so we're starting again with our lemur, light, and now let's say, let's split the ideas apart into their different Smurfs, their spelling meaning unit references. So we've got light, which is not dark. We've got light, which is not heavy. We've got light, which is not serious. We've got light, which is not fattening. Those are now different things. They're not our lemur. They are uh, separated out given their own reference numbers and we can work with them independently. Now, when we talk about the idea of what, what are these things in other languages, we can come up with terms that more or less mean the same thing um, in here, the example is in French. Um, and we can come up with things that mean more or less the same thing also in Swahili, also in Finnish, also in Thai. And this is what I call a duck. So this is a one concept unified knowledge set. Um, so we have the concept, the idea, and they are all tied together based on the idea, the semantic relationship, not the spelling relationship. Uh, yeah, this next thing, the next idea of not heavy is a different duck. The next thing, not not serious, is a different duck. In each of the with members Smurfs from each of the languages, the idea of not fattening is a different duck. And so here we are. We've gotten all our ducks in a row. And you can all laugh again, but you're all on mute, so I didn't hear it, but I imagine it was thunderous. Um, you can see that we can then, you know, these, the, the lemurs in French here that all mean léger, that, that, are, that are all based on léger, are not confused with this L-I-G-H-T or, or with a duck. So something like the French concept of Sandy, which happens to use the same uh, spelling, that just is a French thing and doesn't come over to uh, complicate things in other languages. On our lab server, we've got over 2 million Smurfs um, in 122 languages. Now, some of those are very small data sets. Um, so, but uh, on the production server, we've got 138,000 ducks. I'm not sure exactly how many of those are Smurfs, something like 100, a million 500,000. Um, and that's across 44 languages. Uh, and those are things that you can play with, and you'll see later, a bit later on akamusi.org to get the meanings from one to the next because you're going through the duck. Okay. So, what does the 4D stand for? for so, 4D stands for four dimensional. CAM obviously stands for Kamusi. Um, and here the time is the fourth dimension. So, I won't go into any detail about this, but this is the idea that. Um, language changes over time. So we could actually, because of the way we have data, we can actually show that something is, for example, comes from Middle English, comes from Old English. Um, what the term is or that, that, that 
it is so you know have an old have an old English dictionary basically with the old English membership in the duck, and then you could chase trace the old English over to the old German and then down to uh, Dutch, contemporary Dutch, and you could actually follow those that that chain of time. Um, if we have the data, we don't have the data at this point, so um, calling it 4D is kind of bragging about what we can do in the future, not about what we have in the present. Um, so as I said, it's a graph, a, a structure for a complete matrix of human expression across time and space. Uh, I won't talk that much about space uh, at the moment, um, but of course this is, you know, we can't really get every word in every language across time, but by setting that as the goal, we're able to sit there and say, okay, let's, how, how do we, you know, what, what sorts of things do we need to do to get there? And let's do this part. Let's see if we can do this part. Let's see if we can do that part. You know, it ends up being something that I'll call, that I end up calling molecular lexicography because of the way things connect. Um, so before I get going, um, please, I will recommend that you re follow this link and read the much more detailed article about what is going on within, uh, within CAM4D. Um, now, I've, previously, I've been showing light, our little lemur, as a circle. Let's uh, take the idea and instead and make it into a little star or a big star. Here, we've got one Smurf uh, idea from, for, for light, the uh, idea of not dark. So that's our Smurf. And that little Smurf has a bunch of different aspects, which I've divided down into meaning, place, time, relationships, sound, and shape. Uh, I won't go into each aspect of each of these aspects, but you can see that they all have smaller things that come out from them that are also being dealt with within the database. So one of those relationships, uh, relationships across languages is, is one relationship. So, so, so the duck is one relationship, an antonym, um, language, words, words, uh, uh, synonyms, words uh, spawn, words that derive from it, or ancestors, the words that it came, came from are also other relationships. Um, but here, let's talk a little bit about meaning. Um, if we have a word like drive, it has a lot of different meanings. Um, so you can drive animals when you're hurting them. You can drive a, a golf ball. You can by hitting it. You can drive a car. That's the one you probably that probably comes to mind. You can drive somebody to do something. How does this then end up working? Looking in in the dictionary. So here is an actual dictionary search from the live version, not from the production version, which is has it has a more sophisticated set of views. But uh, um, the server went offline yesterday, so I couldn't do the screenshots that I wanted. Um, so here I've just done a search from this word in Portuguese, uh, homem, and forgive me if I mispronounce any Portuguese or any Zulu. So I've gone from Portuguese to Zulu, uh, not something that you can expect to do in most contexts and get a good result. Uh, here is the result. Um, and let me uh, get a little bit more so you can see we've got various ducks, various different correspondences between meanings. So we've got, I'll, I'll, I focused in on a couple. Um, here we've got the per Portuguese Smurf homem and a definition of what that thing is in Portuguese and a definition and, and the, the Zulu uh, corresponding term indoda. And if there are those of you who speak English you can probably tell whether that is a correct definition. We also route it, show the English that it's routed through. Uh, in this case, it's because it is coming through the word net, the Zulu is coming through the African word net uh, produced by um, the, our friends at UNISA. Uh, in uh, Pretoria, um, and you know, I think it's it's the the honest thing to do is to show where why we're making this relationship that we're not, you know, we are computing it, but we're computing on on this basis of what the common English thing is. So in this case, in Dota would be an adult male, uh, basically, whereas this version of this thing that also corresponds to Portuguese 
Homem means umuntu, which is a person in general. So uh, in English, they both happen to have go through this idea of man, the, the man as 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 our uh, lemur, but um, they do have different meanings. Therefore, they are you know, they end up getting different Smurfs in different ducks. So let me add in now the ideas of costumes and wardrobes. Uh, so a costume is um, you know, if you have a word like drive, um, drive is, a, as we say, the, the dictionary form, but there are also these other forms, drove, driven, driving, uh, that all attach to this, to the dictionary form. Um, and together, the, the, that set of things drive, drove, driven, drives, um, driving are a wardrobe. This is so, you know, each of the different Smurfs of drive are going to be attached to the same wardrobe. And that's essential for being able to do more advanced processing as I will show in a while. Okay, still good on time. Um, so these, this is where I was talking about shape. These uh, costumes all attached to this idea of drive. Um, and wh so whether you drove a car or you drove a golf ball or you drove animals, we're not gonna add that to each, uh, each sense separately within the database. We'll just have that one time, but then have the, the map linking. So that's a bit of the data science that probably is not you know that, that lexicographers don't want to have to deal with, but uh, is important to deal with for for uh, computational purposes. And as these different things all tie together, so you know the the, the other things like place and sound relationships all tie together. They uh, work together in this kind of molecular way that they bond and and twist and uh, and join together. Um, and I should just give a shout out to some of the guys who've done programming specifically on CAM4D. Uh, Greg McKean is in uh, the Johannesburg air area. Um, he started us off. And then Sina Mansour is Iranian. He's now in Australia. He moved us along. And now we have this uh, Yerohom Baton in Paris, who has actually written the book on Neo4j, which is the database underlying CAM4D. Uh, I will now talk a bit about some of the projects we have happening in Kamusi Labs. And so, um, uh, so Kamusi Labs is what I call this, uh, the, the group that is working on, uh, on different projects all related to this database structure and making, gathering linguistic data and putting it to service for for people. Um, physically, we're based here in Lausanne, but this is something that involves, it, it's really a virtual lab. So I've got, so, so students come from various universities around the world say, okay, can I do a semester project? Can I do a, 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 a year long or a master's project? And if they have the right set of skills and the right enthusiasm, uh, the answer often is yes. Now, it usually works a lot better if there's some incentive to keep people going like a grade or you know um if, if the university says okay you can get course credit for this um <coughs> this is not something where we have uh funding to be able to pay people to do things so it really is uh kind of an honor, honor thing you know, but uh usually um by having students and and others working on it from various places people are able to help each other out uh, for instance, um, I've got somebody, uh, a, a student who just finished a, his undergrad degree in uh, India, Akash, who is working on a lot of different things. Um, and we've had this recently we've been working with somebody in Ireland, somebody of Pakistani origin, but he's in the UK. Um, you know, so we get together, we either have meetings together um, online or people, I'll meet with people individually um, over the you know, sort of across time zones and over weeks and days and weeks on uh, 
on WhatsApp or on, on other things to talk about what's going on, make things, keep things going, and then people are able to help each other, but it's not a physical space. Um, so our projects are largely, a lot of it is about gathering data. So there are projects that we have uh, that are for gathering data for African languages, but also for you know, if, other languages around the world is that there, as Menno said, there are 7,000 officially languages here. Um, this is not exclusive to, the, the idea is to be as inclusive as possible to get, to get as many languages as we have interest and resources to, to work on. I'll talk a bit about Slow Brew because that's uh, a fun project that shows the potential of how, how the CAM 4D all works together. Mention a bit about PALE and then show you some of the pro other projects. So gathering data for African languages. Uh, should be fairly straightforward what it is that we're talking about, right? We've got our duck. Um, we add in more languages. Um, and if they are languages spoken in Africa, then we can put all the terms from that language into the duck. Um, now, obviously, this misses a lot of indigenous concepts because we're going from a kind of an English out perspective, and I'm not thrilled about that, but uh, that's what we can work with at the moment, uh, unless we can work specifically with people in, who, who are going out and doing field research in their, in their own language. Um, how do we gather data? Well, so there are a few different things. If we have an existing data set, um, you know, that Word file or the Excel file that we can put into a, uh, into an initial version of, of, of the database, separating out, okay, this is the, for example, this is the, the word that said to be L-I-G-H-T, you know, this is light in whatever, in language X, and we know it's a, uh, an adjective. Okay, then what do we have in uh, what do we have in English that are is light and adjectives? Okay, we should, now we can present a person or players with uh, the possibilities, and they can choose. Okay, I mean not heavy, or I mean not dark, or I mean not serious. Um, if we've got an expert who's somebody who's tasked with doing this, then we can go quickly through that. If it has to be a game. Uh, if it has to be the public, then we have to make it into a game. And then once we get several people giving the same answer and people get points and various rewards for, for this, then we can then we can believe the, the answer that we're getting. But we don't with, with any of the games, we don't want to have uh, just trust the first person who tells us something if they're not um, a, a, an expert in that language. So then we have other games for that either exist in rudimentary form or in concept form um, for getting various forms of linguistic data from microdata from, from the crowd. Um, and then also a more extensive thing for getting lots of richer data from experts. Now, the problem with experts is anybody who's an expert in a language is probably busy and needs to earn money. And so we need to get money to pay people and find uh, and, and work on time you know, work with their time. So that's um, a longer term um, way of doing this. You, know, this. you can't get good linguistic data just by hoovering it in um, from, from somewhere, especially for African languages. This, you know, to, if it doesn't exist, uh, you've got to go out and, and ask for it, um, which isn't, uh, all that expensive a proposition versus, versus a lot of other things that Silicon Valley spends its money on. But um, when they look at you know, a language like Kosa, uh, then suddenly it becomes, seems like you know, the, the money that would be involved in doing that is, is too much for uh, most foundations to begin to think about the way, in, in, in the mindset that they have. Okay, a couple of minutes about slow brew. Um, I'm coming towards the end here. Uh, a couple of minutes about slow brew, um, because as I said, one of the long-term objectives is some sort of translation that is much better than what you've seen with something like Google Translate. And I pick on Google Translate because 
I did do this uh, study of what of how they operate across all 108 languages, but this is a bigger issue related to machine translation in general. So all of the machine translation things are dealing with computational processes that uh, I think are probably in the long term better addressed by this human knowledge assisted translation instead. So let's quickly go through this. We've got, um, and I call it slow brew because, you know, machine translation is what it tends to be this instant coffee kind of mix. You take your thing and you mix it in and you get something that kind of uh, looks like coffee is reminiscent of coffee when you sip it, but is not a nice espresso that you've with good, uh, you know, something, something that you've taken the time to grind and really work through and, and come up with good flavor that you can trust and enjoy. Okay. Um, so this depends on this idea of the Smurfs of being able to disambiguate your meanings. Um, and also being able to disambiguate party terms. Now, this is something that machine translation does horrendously these days. So something like on the up and up or uh, kick the bucket. Uh, usually machine translation is just not going to recognize that those things go together. And if they are separated, um, as can easily happen with certain party terms, like just drive up the wall, you drive somebody up the wall, you drive your mother, brother, and sister up the wall. You, know, you can see that you can get things farther and farther apart and machine translation just cannot handle that. Um, so let's look at this sentence. Uh, she drove everyone in her class at school up the wall last night. Um, so what we're gonna, going to be doing with through Chem 4D is, first of all, we take drove, we put that into drive, and we're going back and looking at different things that begin with drive, um, knowing that drove is one of the costumes. Uh, uh, but we're not looking now for just for drive, those four things that we saw before, driving the golf ball um, or uh, driving the car or driving the animals. We know that we've got something that starts with drive in our sentence. We can do things, we can look for any, because we've lexicalized the, the party terms, we've put, in them, put them in the dictionary also. So drive up the wall is its own term, its own concept that has a meaning that can be put into other languages independent of driving um, and you know, independent of whether it's a party term in the, in the other language or a single word in the other language. We can say, okay, things start with, let's look and see if what, what we have as party terms that start with drive, we've got drive up the wall, drive to distraction. Um, if anywhere farther downstream in the sentence, we see up the wall, oops, yep, there we got it. Okay, now let's propose that drive up the wall is the meaning that might, is an available meaning uh, for, 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 for this sentence. Uh, school, we can look and see, okay. Um, we're talking about an educational place. We're not talking, oh, or class, we're talking about an educational place, not a social status or uh, her class or style. Um, school is, we're not talking about a group of fish. We're not talking about a group of thinkers. We're talking about the educational institution. Now that's something that in this case is probably going to come up statistically anyway um, in, in most machine translation programs, but uh, we might want to let the person confirm that rather, or you know, give, give the option of shifting from that um, for, for other translation purposes. And then last night, not the final night, but uh, we're talking about the night before that these things operate together. Uh, let's see how that works in other translation services. She drove everyone up the wall and okay, Microsoft, I'm not picking on Google here. Uh, my, Microsoft has here this concept of driving is in driving a car. Okay, that's a fail. Um, for some reason, they're asking us to tell us that to submit this as a translation for that they can use this for machine learning purposes. Obviously, that's an, a really bad idea since I don't know enough, probably don't know enough if I'm asking a machine translation program to, to tell me something. Um, then, you know, why, why would I tell them that, yes, what you gave me is good when I don't know it? Okay, let's hear this is uh, Sistran, I think. Um, it's blocked out. Uh, 
Fait à grimper le mur. Uh, yes, there's, there's this idea of climbing a wall. Now, of course, in French, this thing would have nothing to do with walls. Or, um, so it has nothing to do with conduits and driving a car. It has nothing to do with walls. Um, here, both uh, Sustran and Deep Bell actually got a nice little victory. Um, every, when she drove everyone in her class, they figured out that in her class meant students, uh, les élèves. So kudos there. Um, but you can see that you don't just want to trust your automatic machine translation program. You want to be able to go and choose, yes, this is what I mean, um, and then use the duck. Once you've said, yes, this is what I mean, then we can use the duck to go and find the equivalent term in, in language B. And then once the person has said, okay, on the source side, this is what I mean in, uh, in, the, in, in where I'm starting from. And then we, uh, we can think about ways, this would be more of a PhD kind of project, we can think about ways to uh, learn from what the people are telling us themselves from the language they actually understand, which is the source language. Um, unanswered questions, will people actually take the time to, to pre-disambiguate? I would like to think yes. You know, if you go to Google Images and you look for wild turkey, you don't just say, okay, I'm going to take the first thing that's wild turkey because you could end up with either a wild animal turkey or the alcoholic drink called wild turkey or a picture of Turkish wilderness. Um, you yourself as the person want to make that choice. People do that all the time. You, um, so uh, I think they would do that for translation. Also, people take the time to spell check. Um, how to put this all together so that you get good syntax on the other side, you know, good grammatically correct Zulu or, or, or Wallaf. Uh, that's outside of what we're, uh, we've got specializations to do, but there are ways, you know, because we've got with the data, that's uh, something that we are able to do. Okay, how to pay for it, I have no idea. Okay, quickly now, um, I mentioned pale. Um, so PALE is the platform for African languages that, that Akalan is going to be working on, and Kamusi is going to be at the center for linguistic data um, for as many African languages as we can get. Now, uh, Akalan wants to start with these 20 VCBLs. Now look closely at that, and this is, a, uh, is, is problematic from the perspective of those of you in the audience, because look what's missing, uh, Zulu, Wallaf, most of the other 11 uh, languages, official languages within South Africa. Why? Because they are not cross-border languages. They don't enjoy uh, support outside of South Africa. So they're not seen in an African Union context as that important. So this is something that we would need to be thinking that I, you know, thinking with Sadalar about what resources Kamusi can bring to the table for your languages. That's uh, a conversation for future days. Okay, so there are a lot more projects. I will just give a glimpse at them um, and then leave the last 10 minutes or so for, for questions. Um, I won't go through these individually, um, but uh, maybe I will leave this slide up if people want to ask questions about those. I should mention, though, a couple of them. One is this, what I'm calling the EdTech Trio. A lot of this data can be used for uh, learning within African languages. So, um, so that would be a, uh, a, a, a COSA speaking student would be able to have access to like information about COSA that they that that she or he could use for continuing to learn just to study economics or biology within COSA rather than having to learn another language in order to be able to learn that subject. You know, obviously, students in a place like Romania aren't learning biology in. English or French, they're learning biology and Romanian. Why is that not? I, I would, you know, that's not a possibility. I think in, in most uh, South African languages or other African languages. So, but the data that we get could be quite used within that if we do it correctly. Um, of course, you, people who speak African languages do, do want to learn other languages. Um, so, from African languages to learn English or French or Chinese or Walla for uh, or, or Quechua of South America. Um, and for people who want to learn African languages, either other Africans, you know, lear learning other languages uh, for, for, for one African to learn another 
language outside of the one they, they know, or for people from elsewhere to learn uh, Zulu or Swahili or, or uh, Amharic. Um, and then the other two that I want to mention are this box of boxolex. So here, if we're talking about big languages, a lot of, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of African languages that are spoken by millions of people. Um, but there are, as I said, 2000 languages, some of which are spoken by very small groups of people in pretty uh, remote places. Boxolex would be a field lexicography toolkit that people could take to the field with them for a master's program project, for example, for three months of research where they don't have to invent any of the, um, any of the uh, aspects of how do you collect data and they don't have to figure out what terms they're looking for because they've got a list of, of uh, common, uh, of kind of universally popular human topics, stars and body parts and whatever. And you can ask people about them and get it right into the computer. And then that gets right back into COM4D as soon as you get back to the network. Uh, so that would be for a, useful for a lot of languages that are not, that don't enjoy broad public support, but it wouldn't be all that expensive. Again, there's money to get the field researcher out there and supported, but it wouldn't be all that expensive to get a lot of basic data for a lot of languages. Takamusi would be a talking dictionary where you know, a lot of languages are not written or uh, the people, you know, you know, there are ways to get not, not just the lemmatic form uh, spoken, say, uh, but to actually get examples of people speaking, giving definitions in their, you know, speaking a definition and then you taking that audio and being able to do other things with that later, uh, transcribing it, uh, making various other resources for that language to preserve the language. And this is especially important when we're talking about endangered languages um, that where there are only that, where, where there are not that many people left speaking them and these could disappear. So without the audio, um, to preserve the to preserve the sounds and attach it to what they actually mean, these things could vanish from human heritage forever. So I think this is through CAM4D a, a way to preserve languages, but again, something that needs uh, some sort of institutional support in order to make it happen. Uh, one other thing is sign languages. Um, these are things that are gestures. Um, we've talked with several people, have ongoing talks about trying to do South African sign languages, among other lang sign languages. Uh, not there yet, we, uh, uh, but it is an aspiration, as are some of these other things. But I think I should stop there and ask if there are questions from uh, members of the audience. I do encourage questions and happy to answer anything. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this, wonderful, for, for this wonderful presentation. These were not the Smurfs that I was expecting, although the blue ones were in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I do see there are a few questions. So Tanya has two questions. Um, so the way I, well, Tanya sees it, Smurfs and ducks don't necessarily work one-on-one -on -one across languages. How mm -hmm. do you deal with that? And also, you take a particular language to come up with the initial ducks. How do you choose which language that, that should be? Okay. So yes, very much things do not, you know, language is not binary. There are not direct correlations one to the next. Um, the th things get to be marked within COM4D as parallel or similar or um, there are actually things where you actually have to give a term in one language as explanatory rather than um, because the term doesn't necessarily exist in that language. An example might be winter. In Swahili, we really don't have a concept for winter, um, but you need to have a Swahili term or some, some, some way of expressing this idea of winterness um, in Swahili, so that when somebody is, re is reading in something in English, or or another language which does have winter, um, they can understand what the heck is going on with that. So the idea is you come up with some sort of uh, pithy way of expressing winter, and then you say, then you mark that this is not really Swahili. This is uh, 
this is a clue that we're we're using temporarily, but you know, but but uh, ha it can have its uses. Um, you know, this idea of something that's similar. I know this. I, I don't remember the the words in uh, the Bantu languages of South Africa and Swahili again, which is also a Bantu language. You've got this. Um, you know, in English, we've got this thing which is hand, and we've got this thing which is arm. Um, hopefully this is coming across on my video. I don't see my own video. Um, but in Swahili, the you've got this thing that's mkono from here to here. Okay, so that's obviously not the same. So yes, arm is mkono, hand is mkono, but mkono is not the same thing as either arm or hand. We just have to mark it that, um, that there is a difference. And then the difference gets its own field kind of like a definition field where you get free text to write and say, okay, the difference between mkono and arm is this, this sort of thing. Now that you can't do that for every, you know, between each idea in all 7,000 languages, but you can provide the space for that to happen as people want to add that information. And you can also, if, you know, if this difference between arm, between hand and arm is the same difference in Zulu and in Swahili, you could then actually within the graphing structure mark that this, uh, the Zulu term and the Swahili term are actually equivalent, uh, not similar. Starting with English, because that's where all the data is. Um, so it's very much a, uh, you know, privileging this one international language of conquest. Um, that's what we got now, if we can, uh, get other languages. There are other languages that are bridge languages that we hope to bring in later that, you know, that will work when we have good data for those languages that will work to bring in their satellite languages, related languages. So Russian would be one, Spanish, um, French, um, Chinese, Chinese, there's a whole bunch of complications I won't be able, to, yeah, I can't talk about right now, but, you know, there are a hundred different other languages other than the Chinese that are taught in China that would be entering by reference to Chinese um, and, you know, and a few other big languages. But uh, the starting point because of the history of language uh, of uh, languages on as data has to be English. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is, that is a kind of practical approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then I had another question. Uh, how do you go about crowdsourcing and what are your experiences with the quality you get from it? I actually had the same question written down. Mm -hmm. So my, my personal experience is that the quality needs to be very, very carefully checked uh, or the, the inputs. So how do you now do you deal with that? And what is the quality that you get? Right. Um... So the idea behind crowdsourcing is to ask the same question over and over again for from a bunch of different people until you see the same thing coming in um, enough that you, you can be pretty confident in it. Now, what is the number that you need for getting validated data. I don't know. You know, obviously one person telling you that something is something is, is, is the answer is not adequate. You don't want to ask a hundred people the same question because that's way overkill. Um, so this is something that over time is going to need to involve some testing. My feeling is that about five, you know, once you start seeing the same thing about five times, you can be uh, fairly confident that you're getting good information. Um, Is the number ten? I don't know. The number is probably not three, um, except in certain in circumstances. If you see that, if three people mark something as bad information, you can be confident that yes, this is starting to be bad information. Um, are you going to miss things this way? Yes. So, for example, um, these things here are glasses. And so if everybody tells, you know, if we get five people telling us these are glasses, we can be confident they're glasses. But what if one person tells us they're spectacles? Um, there happen to be spectacles as well. 
uh, we then have to put spectacles aside and then test spectacles separately to see, okay, was that bad information? Like if, you know, did somebody send in GALSES, G-A-L-S-S-E-S, -S -S instead of glasses? Well, that's bad information, we can rule it out, but we want to rule spectacles in. Um, these are things that some of which we, in, in the initial games that we put on phone, but then right now they're not working on the phone anymore on um, for, for technical reasons, um, we'll get them back. Some of those we've addressed in some of the initial games, but some of them are for future uh, development. And I welcome the help through the development. I, I have ideas and you know, know, have specs on how to do it, but not right now the, the horsepower to, to implement some of those things. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of interesting open questions about crowdsourcing um, that we would, you know, can only deal with through through uh, through experimentation and seeing what happens. Um, crowdsourcing is also works pretty well when you've got a group, you know, a language spoken by a million people, like Font in Dinan, where we have a group of uh, young adults who are really, you know, they've all got mobile devices and they were all really keen on helping out with uh, a project, we're, a little project we were doing for Fond. Um, it's not so useful if you've got a language which is spoken by a very few number of people, you know, a very small number of people who are in a remote area and elderly and don't are not technology literate and don't have the time or the uh, money to spend on uh, connectivity. Um, so it, right, it's, it's really biased towards better connected languages, but you know, there are a lot of groups of uh, speakers who are sitting, who are very thirsty for helping develop things, resources for their language languages and, or who just enjoy playing word games. You know, I play word games in English every day um, you know, and I know those word games are not available, but, you know, they're not played in other languages because they're not available They're not, it's not that they're not fun. So if we can put some fun ways of people to play games for their languages, and then they, um, and then we can learn from that. I think everybody wins, um, proposition for a lot of languages that's yet to be proven, but I think uh, it, it will be fairly easy to prove as, as soon as we can get those things, uh, set and alert the communities that they're there and you know build up the the user base yeah no, definitely i think we should see this as a as a challenge uh, I, I do see that we're kind of running out of time um so i do understand that people need to leave to next meetings etc i mean I'm, I'm still happy to uh, to stay and have some more uh, questions but i also realize if people need to leave that they they will need to leave uh, Oh, now I, my chat is gone. Uh, I see Masibidi uh, asked the question, so what specific crowdsourcing guidelines can you advise a researcher working on this that have worked for you in the past? That's very practical. What specific crowdsourcing guide? Um, I guess I would, uh, nobody who's worked with me has then gone off to work on their own crowdsourcing project. People have gone off to work in uh, other various um, interesting technology um, places, but not specifically on crowdsourcing as far as I know. Um, a lot of the problems are not so much uh, theoretical related to crowdsourcing, but a lot of them are practical related to uh, and the things that have run us into problems practical related to making sure that you don't get spam, you don't get people who are trying to, um, you know, you don't get sock puppets, people who are trying to control their own, push their own um, agendas, their own terms. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of back-end development that I would talk with somebody about 
if they were interested in things things that need to happen in order to not get flooded by Russian bots who are trying to to, to game you and, and make your life miserable. Um, but uh, you know, registration um, issues and security issues and that sort of thing. Um, for other aspects of crowdsourcing, I think you know, crowdsourcing things have to be fun. People need to be able to enjoy what they're doing, see a purpose in what they're doing, and want to keep on coming back. It's very easy for somebody to start, play five minutes, play 20 minutes, and then never come back again. So the retention is something that we uh, haven't really spent that much time working on yet, but I think uh, is, is something that somebody really needs, you, know, you really need to focus on, because otherwise, um, you, know, you can spend do a lot of upfront effort to recruit people and then end up people disappear. We've had over the years with things I've done, you know, some people who have been extremely loyal and keep on coming back because they enjoy what they're doing. And that's uh, so trying to build relationships rather than just have this uh, be a, have it be something that somebody signs on to uh, kind of who is not connected in any sort of personal way. Um, is a way to lose people fairly quickly. So. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I propose to uh, to stop here, even though there are still many questions. Well, I still have many questions, but we can talk about them later as well. Uh, unless there are any pressing questions, I don't see anything in the chat, but I do see that some people are leaving. No questions? No, okay, so I see another thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Martin. I, I really enjoyed it, and I think the audience in general uh, enjoyed it very much too. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be happy to stick on for a couple more minutes if there are people who are being a bit shy and want to talk but while everybody else goes away or to just to say goodbye to you and uh, plan our next chat. But yeah, I would like to thank everybody who's sat through this far for uh, your attention and for uh, and, and hope that you got something uh, learned something interesting or uh, that you get back that you get in touch with me send me questions by email if or, or, or separately if you wish to um, and wish everybody a, a great day wherever you happen to be wonderful thanks so I didn't see this as a as some sort of punishment like when you said like see it through to the end this was not punishment to me at least <laughs> thanks so martin so i will just continue asking mm -hmm. my questions and i was actually wondering i really liked it, that idea of that slow brew um mm -hmm. you know trying to resolve some of the um the machine translation uh issues um so I, there were a few things I was wondering. So do you, if you build something like that, do you fully rely on the, the, the graph that you have or do you, because then you miss the, the syntax, right? So you could also do something like use existing machine translation tools and then start improving based on the knowledge that you have. Right, that's where I see it going. I see it as, a, as very much a hybrid kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, if we would, yeah, you know, the long-term objective is machine learning. The problem with machine learning, the way it's put into play with uh, translation is that you get all these proposals, but you don't actually learn from them because you don't know, you know, you've got no human confirmation that what the machine is coming up with through neural networks um, or, or through statistics is actually the correct thing. It's just this assertion that uh, this is the translation, but it's not. Uh, something that you've come to any sense that a, an actual human is is happy with and, and can believe yeah. um when basically what's happening if if we do it on the slow brew side is that we're getting all of these these things are annotated right so we're getting all of these human annotations and then we can learn use learn from those human annotations one by one in this concept yes you know drive up the wall drive mm -hmm. and up the wall are, are, are connected uh for example Okay, but these are essentially long distance dependencies sometimes in your example mm -hmm. they were relatively far apart mm -hmm. and that's that's of course, of course quite difficult to to identify mm -hmm. 
quite difficult for a machine to identify, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, in the prototype that we have, you know, it's very easy for um, a person to just click, yes, this, these, these three words are connected or these five words are connected. Dunk. Um, and then it becomes easy for a computer to propose that that could be a connection hmm. uh, if, it, if it sees those. Um, another thing that it's easy for the computer to do is to float the proposed uh, equivalent in the other language, or the, 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 the uh, sorry, the float the proposed uh, uh, concept within the source language as that, that it thinks is probably the most likely. Um, so if it's school, I float the idea of school, the educational institution above the idea of a uh, school of fish, um, still give you the chance to go and say, no, no, I mean school of fish, mm -hmm. but um, as opposed to the way, for example, all of the translation programs, the, the, the algorithms work these days, where if you've got say spring, spring is spring the season, spring the mechanical device, uh, spring water coming out of the ground. Um, 40% of the time in the corpus, spring is going to be spring the season. And maybe 10% of the time, each of those other concepts. That means that the translation program is always 100% of the time, or almost always, you know, 98% of the time going to give you spring the season. So even if something like spring in her step is going to be the dealing with the season in, you know, um, just because 40% is a lot more likely than 10% in each of those other cases. Um, we would say, let's float spring the season, but give you the chance to go to spring the fountain or spring the, uh, the mechanical device. Yeah. Um, and then learn from, okay, if we see um, mountain spring, that's probably, you know, people keep on using spring, you know, water coming from the ground. Let's in, when, when we see mountain and spring together, you know, we can learn from that and then float that for, for future. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's essentially um, kind of the task of word senses in the duration. Mm -hmm. right? So the, I, I don't know exactly what the current state of the art is in word senses in duration. I remember the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, it was very popular. And everybody said, oh yeah, because we, we can use this in machine translation. And to be honest, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this really being applied in machine translation, <laughs> but I think right. in a system where you, what, what, what you have essentially, you need to have that information to, to get to the right translations. Mm -hmm. so it would actually be a good situation where you could actually implement word sensitive disintegration, perhaps not even to, to perfectly make the choice, but to decide on the ordering of the floating of the, the meanings. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. Yeah. The, th those are questions that, you know, I don't have easy answers to, but I, other than, you know, let's get the data and, you know, mm. it, it can be answered. It can be answered through the system. Yeah. Um, and another, so when you're talking another, your other question about syntax, um, One of the things I think we can do is, you know, get language models from different languages, um, and then largely, um, you know, you know your word order, adjective, uh, noun word order, for example, or these things. So that's a wire that's coming out from. Those are wires that come out from one language, and then another language has its wires. And if you can connect the wires correctly, you can get. You might be able to get understandable translations from one language to another, even if you don't have models between them uh, to start with, and then work on tweaking those models, one, you know, the, those connections, once you have somebody who actually understands both how, how both of those languages work together. Um, but 